We Got Him by Elizabeth Searle, narrated by Tanya Eby. We Got Him. Boston Mayor Tom Menino. Twitter message following capture of marathon bombing suspect April 19, 2013. Prologue. Someone's son. Bomber boy, Sarah kept silently chanting. The dark-eyed young Boston Marathon bombing suspect kept hovering, all night, on the birthroom TV. Below him, Sarah lay in wait, in labor, two months too soon, timing intently her own breaths. Bomber boy, one, two, three. His blurred, sullen face kept mixing up, in Sarah's stunned mind, with the equally sullen face of her nineteen-year-old stepson, PJ, maybe in police custody by now, and with the big-eyed face of the little boy blown up days before the Boston Marathon finish line. Bomber boy, four, five, six. All those boy faces mixed with the fierce, fuzzy ultrasound face of the baby boy inside her. A swirly close-up seemingly taken in outer space, but really an inner space she'd never quite believed she had. Until him. His unformed, creamy, astronaut face the face that she and Paul had awaited for years. A baby too late. And now, tonight? Too early. Where was Paul? Teenage jihadist? The TV asked. Then a rush of shakily filmed gunshots. Massive manhunt underway. And, Sarah told herself sadly, he was someone's son. I'm turning off the damn TV, her husband Paul announced behind her bed curtain in his deepest supervisor voice. He was back in the birth room, back from handling whatever, Sarah was scared to ask, was going on with PJ. It's upsetting my wife. Bomber boy, seven, eight, nine. No, Sarah managed between breaths. The boyish suspect in his white cap hovered yet again on screen. She didn't want it, him, to go away. Because, she decided dazedly, he had become it, her fixed object, the object that birthing class instructor had told them to choose and focus on in the birth room. He did look, didn't he, in those unfocused finish line shots? Like Paul's son, PJ. Defiant teen boy stance, flat, dark stare. So damn young. Surely he hadn't really done it. Bomber boy, ten, eleven, twelve. Sarah squeezed shut her eyes, like a kid making a birthday wish. A healthy full-term baby the biggest, simplest wish of Sarah's 35-year-long life. But nothing about getting her son, her and Paul's son, had been simple. Nothing had gone according to what to expect. That battered paperback knocked off their bed earlier on this very night in the impulsive lovemaking they never should have dared in her seventh month. The dog-eared book, spotted with fresh blood by the time they got out the door. They drove through panicky traffic and siren-filled streets, hearing the radio reports of Boston in chaos and bombing suspects reportedly on the run. A siren behind their own speeding car. PJ in the back seat, hoarsely urging Paul to drive faster. Sarah beside Paul, holding on to her belly. Paul steering headlong into what he'd dubbed the rotary of doom. Then the jolt, the bump. Paul crashing onto Doom's central island, into its two Boston sign. Blue and white Belmont police car lights fitfully flashed on Paul's stoic profile and gray-flecked beard, his hair still curly and dark like his son PJ's, and like that of the bombing suspects, those digitally enhanced, instantly famous faces, photos released by the FBI earlier the same day. Birthday? Or would the Belmont police somehow halt this premature birth? Behind her in the back seat, as the police car door slammed, Sarah felt man-sized PJ duck down. God, what all was going on with PJ? Protectively, Paul and Sarah faced those blaring lights together, PJ cowering behind them. Did he still have the jackknife, which only Sarah had seen, in his jacket? Would he use it this time? Paul and Sarah stiffened like the true culprits. Both of them, Sarah sensed through her pulsing pains and the pulsing lights as the cop approached their car, racing for the worst. Maybe, the unquenchable optimist in Sarah thought, this would bring them together? Bomber boy, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. 
In the beeping monitor light of the birth room, in the pulsing dark of Sarah's squeezed shut eyes, Paul squeaked open her bedside curtain and snapped off the nonstop TV news. Sarah blinked her eyes and it, he, was gone. The hovering bomber boy. No, I, I need him, Sarah managed, pointing a shaky finger to the screen. Paul gaped at her like she was losing it. Bring him back, Sarah wanted to say. But she was panting, straining with a new contraction. He's fine. He's going to be fine, Paul muttered to her, meaning PJ, the baby, the bomber. Paul took Sarah's sweaty hand in his steady one. He squeezed Sarah's fingers so their wedding bands pressed together. Gold, hard as bone. Sarah shut her eyes again, sucked under once more, picturing the boy face that had somehow become PJ, plus the bomber, plus her baby. Bomber boy, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Past midnight now, on this marathon birth night. Mutely, Sarah squeezed Paul's hand back, gold to gold, bone to bone. At least this night of nights, she felt closer to him than she'd felt in months. She and Paul were braced now, pulling together like Boston, Sarah hoped, against the blast of disaster they'd awaited their whole, wholly wedlocked life. Part One Birth Night Chapter One April 18, 2013, 8.30 p.m. Lightning The baby becomes you. In bed that evening, Sarah woke to Paul's words, setting her, setting everything in motion. If he hadn't said those words, Sarah would later wonder, would they have made love that night? Would she and the baby have stayed safe? What? Sarah rolled over, their birds of happiness wedding Afghan sliding off her bare shoulders. Her belly jutted up. She blinked in the half-dark. Her tall, bearded husband stood above her, home early. Baby, she muttered, becomes you, is becoming to you. I was just looking at you, like he'd been doing all week, ever since marathon day. Glints shone in his dark eyes. At me and him, Sarah reminded Paul, caressing her belly. Her son stayed motionless inside her, when pregnant women get upset, she'd read, fetuses fall into anxious stillness. Sorry, Sarah told hers silently. She'd been freaked out since witnessing the marathon bombing from miles away, days before. And now today, thanks to PJ and his crazy visit, she was freaked out for even more reasons than everyone else in Boston. Hey, Sarah, Paul asked as if he'd heard the unspoken sorry. You okay? You overdosing on CNN? He set a sweetened Greek bakery bag on his nightstand with a waxy crackle. Heard on the radio the FBI released the suspect photos. Or they're getting all kinds of leads. There were new trucks and FBI vans blocking Memorial Drive. Paul lifted the remote and switched on their small flat screen TV. News voices blared forth. Back in a minute, with more updates on the search for the bombing suspects. Please, I don't want to see that. Sarah pulled herself upright in bed. She'd switched off the news around noon when she'd glimpsed PJ outside. And I don't want to hear this. Paul muted the creepy, cheery music for an ad they both hated, with a sad-eyed cartoon woman walking under a cartoon cloud and the looming name of an antidepressant. This ad, Paul and Sarah agreed, was depressing in itself. The cute black hole trying to suck the woman in, the cuter little pill pulling her back from the brink. Like you do with me, Paul tried joking now shrugging off the tweedy suit jacket Sarah had bought for his center director job. Hey, I'm the one who's down today, St. Paul, Sarah murmured wryly as he settled on their bed. She seized the remote, switched off the now-smiling cartoon woman, whose oversized doe eyes remained implacably sad. God, Paul, they kept showing that sweet, big-eyed little boy who got killed at the finish line. I kept picturing that little girl I held on to. Her voice choked. She was teary-eyed, as she'd been on and off all afternoon. All week since the marathon, every loud sound startled her, even though she'd been too far down the marathon route to hear the actual blasts. Paul climbed into bed fully dressed, stretching his big bare body beside hers. Sarah knew she should tell Paul right away about PJ and his surprise visit today, after so many months MIA. God, Paul, 
she whispered instead like one word. She snuggled closer, shaking back her rippled, unbraided.